The other thing that happened is during this war, when we took prisoners of war, as that is to say the Union versus Confederates, um, we would send them back after they were prisoners of war, but they would come out fighting. So Lincoln passed a, an edict of some sort that when prisoners of war were taken, they had to be kept. So we kept the southern boys, but we forced them to keep soldiers they had no intention of keeping. The story you're about to hear is about these two young men who you see on the cover. Interestingly enough, that boy is my great-great-grandfather. His name was Sheldon Russell Curtis. He was conscripted into this army when he was 14 years old. By then, so many boys died, he knew he wasn't coming home. Eventually, he and the lads you see standing next to him were caught, and they were taken to Andersonville Prison. Now, get on your computers if you want to find out about Andersonville. It is in either Andersonville or Anderson, Georgia. It can be called both. One of the worst concentration camps of our time. But it wasn't intended to be. Again, the South was caught in this horror that they didn't intend. This camp originally was meant to only hold 10,000 soldiers, but since they couldn't send any of the boys back, which was the original intention, it swelled to almost 40,000. There was no water. There was no food. The boys literally drank their own urine to stay alive. And they didn't. Uh, I think I think about 20 or 30,000 died of dysentery. I've actually been to Andersonville myself, and I've seen there's huge wells that those boys dug with like soup spoons in their boots. Some of those wells are 20 feet deep. There was no water. The ground was alive with, mag with maggots. When people died, they didn't even bury them. They just laid there. So this was a horror that you cannot imagine. And hopefully none of you will ever, ever have to experience this in your life. But this is the setting of the story. When you look at the half title page, by that I mean it's just a single page with the title on it, you see Pincus A. Lee, he's telling his mother that he is going away to war. She's trying not to look at him because can you imagine, I'm a mother, and if I knew my child was going away to die, I don't think I could look at his face. She's trying not to look at him. She must be horrifying. She, she's just, she's got to be so sad. She can't stand it. But at some point, she does try his uniform hat on him. She's trying to be proud. He's going to go away and fight for the Union. Obviously, his people are slaves. And they did fight for the Union, by the way. In the next page, which is kind of the whole title page, you see my great-great-grandfather, Sheldon Russell Curtis, leaving his farm in Ohio. He's waving at his parents. Their hearts have got to be in their throats. Can you imagine waving goodbye to your child? Because you have to understand, this war was so fierce, they knew they would never see them again, ever. I'm going to read this to you, and again, I want you to keep in your mind how difficult this is for me. I don't read in front of people, and you'll hear why in a minute. I need my reading glasses, and I think it's best if I sit down to do this. And I will begin. When Sheldon Russell Curtis told this story to his daughter Rosa, she kept every word of it in her heart and was re retelling it many times over in her long lifetime. Sheldon had been injured in a fierce battle and was left for dead in a muddy, blood-soaked pasture somewhere in Georgia. He was a mere lad of 15 at the time. He laid there for two days by his own reckoning, only to slip into unconsciousness and fever. He was rescued from this field by another lad who had also been separated from his company. I will tell it as I can in his own words. I watched the sun edge towards the center of the sky above me. I was hurt real bad. For almost a year I've been in this man's war, <coughs> between the states and being just a lad. I was wishing I was home. My leg burned and was angry from the lead ball that was lodged in it just above my knee. I felt sleepy and everything would go black. Then when I'd wake up again, 
I wanted to go back to our farm in Ohio, and sometimes when I was in, when I was in one of them strange sleeps, I'd be there with my mom. I was tasting bacon powder biscuits fresh out of her wood stove. Then I heard a voice, and for a moment I thought I was fever dreaming again. But then I felt strong hands touch my brow and splashed cool water in my face. Being here, boy, means you gotta be dead, the voice said as he gave me a drink from his kit. Where are you hit? Because if it's a belly hit, I gotta leave you here, he said. I'd never seen a man like him so close before. His skin was the color of polished mahogany. He was flying union colors like me. My age, maybe. His voice was soothing and his help was good. I'm, I'm hitting the leg, I told him. Well, it's not bad if it don't go green. Can you put weight on it? He asked me as he pulled me to my feet. We gotta keep moving. If we stay in one spot, marauders will find us. They're riding for drag, and if they find us, they'll kill us for sure. Next thing I remember was collapsing in a heap on the ground and rocking with the pain in my leg. Everything started to go black. And I remember him pulling me up on his back and I heard him say, Lord, you're as bad off as I am. But I'm going to tote you. I can't rightly leave you here. I remember being pulled and carried and stumbling. I remember hard branches snapping back at my face and mouths full of dirt as we hit the ground to keep from being seen. I remember sliding through streams, hauling up small bluffs, and belly crawling through dry fields. I remember these things in a half sleep light, but I do remember he carried me a powerful long way. fever must have took me good because I could feel a cool, sweet smelling quilt right next to my face. Soft, gentle, warm hands were stroking my head with a cool, wet rag cloth. Look at that morning that's coming, a woman's voice said as she spooned oak porridge into me. Do your mama know what a beautiful baby boy she has? Where am I? Is this heaven, I asked. She tossed her head and laughed. No, old child. Pink has brought you home to me, don't you remember? The mahogany child, I thought. Both you children have been on the run for days, and a miracle of God Almighty brought you here. Yes, I mean a miracle. I remember thinking, could this war have been so close to this lad's home? I couldn't imagine having a war right in his backyard. I looked over and saw him looking out the window light. Guess you don't remember much, he said. I'm Pincus A. Lee, fought for the 48th color. Found you after I got lost from my company. Well, my name is Sheldon. Sheldon Curtis, I said weakly. Then he said, this is my mother, sweet Momo Bay. Lord, Lord, I never thought I'd see my dear boy again, she said as she hugged him. I've been getting along, though, Pincus. Warm things got left in the big house for the family left. Dry goods, too. The rest I've been getting from the woods. There's a freshwater spring, still has some chickens, and even got an old cow out back that still gives. Then you've been here all alone? Pincus asked his mother. Where is everybody? Well, your daddy run off to fight a month ago. All the hands and their children run off out of harm's way. But I stayed, Pincus. I prayed to the Lord every day. And my prayers were answered because he brought my baby back here to stay, she said as her face beamed. You ain't never going to leave your mama again, are you, child? She said softly. Pinkus looked troubled and didn't answer. I'm going down to the stream and pound these clothes of yours, she said. She ready to leave us. If you hear marauders coming, get to the root cell. Stay down there till they're gone. That's what I've been doing. Marauders here, Pinkus said with a lie. Well, they seem there ain't nothing here for them. There ain't nothing here for them. I'm just an old woman. As soon as she left us, Pinkus sank to my bedside. Sheldon, boy, he whispered. As soon as you heal up, we've got to get away from here. We're putting Momo Bay in great danger by being here. Don't they come and find she's been holding troopers? 
Then his voice trailed off. We've got to get back to our outfits if we can find them. You, you mean back to the war? I asked. I must have gone pale as he went on to say, well, it's the only way, ain't it? Then he looked at me, Sheldon, you all right? You look bothered, he said as he eased me back. You can call me Say, I said. Everybody in my family calls me Say, not Sheldon. I expect you're my family now. Near enough, Say. Near enough, he said as he chucked the blanket under my feet. And he said, well, you can call me Pick. For the next week, Momo Bay fed us both up good. Raw milk and cornbread never tasted so good in all my warm days. It was the first time in months my middles didn't have mealy worms in it. She saw to it that I tried to walk a little bit every day. So that mean looking leg don't go stiff on you and cripple you up. This place wasn't that much different from our farmhouse in Ohio. More poor maybe, but it smelled the same, like pine boards and good cooking. She used to fix us a mess of beans with salt pork, cornbread, greens, and onions. And when we slept, she sat near us. She stoked the fire and watched over us all night long. Never thought I'd ever feel safe enough to sleep deep again. <coughs> my mother and my father, Kalo, jumped the road broom on this very spot, Peg said as he walked me out on my first day outdoors. And that there was Master A. Lee's house, Peg spoke quietly as he helped me along. How come you have his last name, I asked. Boy, when you owned, you ain't got no name of your own. Even Kalo, my father, had to take that name.